I just watched every Pixar movie, short, and TV show. And today, I'm ranking and discussing all 30 of the studio's biggest and baddest villains. It's gonna be pretty simple. We'll go through all of Pixar's films and rank each of them in our handy dandy tier list. The rankings will go from F tier as the most pitiful excuses for villains, all the way to S tier, representing Dear God, why? <laughs> you get the picture? Good, all right, let's get into it. Starting us off strong is Pixar's very first feature film, Toy Story. In a movie about toys that can come to life, there couldn't possibly be any true villainy at hand, right? <laughs> Wrong. I'd like to introduce you to Sid. Sid isn't just your typical cutesy little kid that you meet on the playground. Oh no, Sid encapsulates everything that could go wrong in parroting. As if his bad haircut wasn't already a red flag, he also wears a t-shirt with a skull on it, so you already know this kid is bad news. Like any normal child, Sid's favorite pastime is to mutilate and torture his toys. Okay, to be fair, he doesn't think his toys are sentient beings, but still, does he not understand the price of toys these days? When Woody and Buzz accidentally falls into the clutches of this deranged child, they see just how twisted his playtime gets. They meet the creepy forgotten toy creations he's responsible for, and also witness him strapping his toys to explosives and blowing them up in his backyard. Hit the dirt. <laughs> now, with all of that being said, let's get into the ranking. If I were a toy, then this could be bad, like Oppenheimer level bad. However, I am not a toy, and at the end of the day, this kid isn't blowing up my human friends and family, so in the grand scheme of things, is he really that bad? Through further examination, Sid just seems like a disturbed child that could really benefit from some therapy. As a villain, he's quite lackluster, and lands around the D tier of evilness. All right! Now it's time to move on to a bug's life. Imagine this, you're walking down a dark alley. You hear footsteps trailing close behind you. Suddenly you're at a dead end and your only option is to turn around and face the terrifying creature behind you. You slowly begin to turn and you find yourself standing face to face with a grasshopper. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Grasshoppers aren't all that scary. But imagine if this grasshopper was 20 times your size, egotistical, bloodthirsty, violent, and extremely tyrannical. Does that sound a little scarier to you? Well, that's how life is in a bug's life. Hopper, our main villain, is a real piece of work. We have the usual tactics. Ruling through fear and abuse, practically enslaving the ant race to bring him food, kidnapping, and genocide. Not one ant sleeps until we get every scrap of food! All right, seems pretty standard and relatively powerful. However, as the movie progresses and Hopper becomes more and more aware of a possible revolt from the ants, he begins to seem shaken. After all, he's more aware than anyone that the ants outnumber the grasshoppers 100 to 1. Those puny little ants outnumber us 100 to 1. So if he's truly that terrified of a species he himself claims is so weak and insignificant, is he truly even that powerful? I don't think so. Besides, if you can't believe in yourself, who else will? Okay, cheesy motivational quotes aside, I think Hopper fits right into the C tier. Because even though he's really not that powerful, he did manage to convince everyone else he was and successfully run a tyrannical regime. So I've got to give him points for that. Plus, he can throw some hands, er, legs? Whatever grasshoppers would hypothetically use to whoop some behind. Anyway, C tier, moving on. Next up, we have Toy Story 2. And what's that? How fitting, we seem to have two villains to discuss. After attempting to save a broken toy that Andy's mother tossed in a yard sale, Woody is stolen by a greedy toy seller slash collector, Al McWiggin. When he's taken to Al's apartment, he meets Jesse and Stinky Pete, the other villain. But we don't learn about that until later. When Woody learns that Al plans to sell the three of them to a toy museum in Japan, We're being sold to the Kanishi Toy Museum in Tokyo! He becomes determined to escape back to Andy, but each and every time Woody tries to bail, his attempts fail mysteriously. 
We later find out that although Stinky Pete initially presents himself as a caring and trustworthy guardian, he's actually manipulative and self-interested. He continuously reminds Jessie of the girl that got rid of her, encouraging her not to trust children. He also reveals that he was behind Woody's failed escape attempts, as he's determined to make sure that they are kept together and shipped off to Japan. Wait a minute, you turned on the TV last night, not Jessie! We learn that Pete was never the fan favorite among children of the Woody's Cowboy Roundup Trio, and grew to become disdainful of children in the space-themed shows that booted their TV show off the air. Children, destroy toys! You'll all be ruined! So basically, Pete's evilness comes from some unresolved trauma. Besides gatekeeping, gaslighting, and girl bossing his way through the film, he does seem to have some redeemable qualities, especially at the end, where he ends up getting forcefully adopted by a little girl, and he becomes much more mellow and accepting of his new life. Al is lazy, greedy, and rude, but evil might be a bit of a stretch. He's just an annoying guy you may unfortunately meet in the line at Target, where he leaves his cart full of frozen foods in the middle of a busy aisle. That that being said, his ranking falls in the F tier. Stinky Pete seems like a high D tier, low C tier, but just because he almost successfully separated Woody from his best friends forever against his will, I'll go ahead and place him in the C tier. Oh dear, I nearly forgot. We can't continue on without talking about Emperor Zurg. Although Zurg isn't deemed a main villain in this movie, I still believe he has a place on our list. Zurg is the sworn enemy of Buzz. So we meet again, Buzz Lightyear. And during some chaos that ensues at Al's toy barn, he escapes and attempts to pursue Buzz. Upon coming face to face with his mortal enemy, he attempts to attack Buzz with his lasers, which in reality are just some foam-like spheres. The two share a heated exchange where Zurg reveals that he is Buzz's father. I am your father. Before he is accidentally knocked down an elevator shaft by Rex's tail. Fortunately, this family rivalry has a good ending, as when Zerg landed from his sharp fall, he hit his head and completely forgot that he is Buzz's enemy. He unites with a new Buzz toy and takes the role of a present father, spending time playing fetch with his new son. Aw, how touching. Though he never posed a true threat, Zerg fully believed in his rivalry with Buzz, much like how Buzz behaved at the beginning of the first Toy Story film. Because of his determination and commitment to eradicating his enemy, Zerg at least deserves a spot as a D-tier villain. Because, hey, at least he tried his best. Again, though, the guy is still a toy. Next is Monsters, Inc., and the main villain is... Dun dun dun! Corporations! Just kidding, it's actually Henry J. Waternoose III. Jeez, what a mouthful. I'm gonna be honest, I probably wouldn't trust a guy who looks like that. My eyes! But, hey, I've been trying to be better about not judging a book by its cover. Although Waternoose seems to just be your average intimidating corporate boss, he is later revealed to be much more than that. Waternoose's family had built an empire with Monsters, Inc., powering the city through the terrified screams of children. However, as time progressed, kids just were not scared of big bad monsters like they used to be. So, tensions were high in the company as they were at the forefront of a giant energy crisis. Waternoose also maintained an atmosphere of fear within the employees at the company, who were always on edge about their proximity to children, which Waternoose claimed were deadly. We obviously later learn that that isn't true when Sully and Mike befriend Boo, a misplaced and very affectionate child. Later, Sully and Mike try to report their co-worker Randall's plan to kill them. He is trying to kill us! This whole thing is Randall's fault! Randall. But Waternoose is too preoccupied on the discovery of Boo to really give them any mind. He takes the child from Sully and Mike and promises them that she'll be in good hands. However, after Waternoose reveals he and Randall are in cahoots, and he shoves Sully and Mike through a door that abandons them in the Himalayas, they begin to doubt the validity of Boo's promised safety. Back at Monsters, Inc., Waternoose begins to grow resentful of Randall since it cost him the loss of two of his top scarers. I never should have trusted you with this. Because of you, I had to banish my top scarer. Randall assures him that the company won't need scarers anymore after his invention, the Scream Extractor. Ah, uh, with this machine, we won't need scarers. A device that forcefully removes the screams from children. Though the side effects, like an ad for a sketchy antidepressant, don't really seem that worth it. 
After using the extractor on a rather unfortunate lackey, the situation is revealed to be a lot more sinister than what initially meets the eye. When Sully and Mike make it back and manage to steal back Boo, Waternoose orders Randall to kill them to prevent any witnesses escaping and revealing their evil plan. Like stop him! Waternoose manages to corner Sully in Boo's room, and Sully attempts to talk some sense into him. However, Waternoose admits that he would be willing to kidnap thousands of children and forcefully extract their screams if it meant that Monsters, Inc. would thrive and the energy crisis would be solved. I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die! When Sully reveals that they were actually in a fake simulation bedroom surrounded by other witnesses, Waternoose is arrested as he berates Sully for ruining the company. However, when Sully is promoted to CEO, he uses the laughter of children, which turns out is stronger than their screams thus ending the energy crisis. So this already terrifying looking creature was knowingly working with a trigger happy jealous incel, was willing to kidnap literal defenseless children in order to essentially suck the life force out of them for a profit. Yeah, that sounds downright diabolical. And we can completely overlook Randall in all of this since he is in fact the brains behind the whole operation and is responsible for creating the monstrosity of the scream extractor. Using his brains for evil, plus conspiring to kill Sully and Mike fully out of jealousy, makes him pretty evil himself. So I think we can consider both Waternoose and Randall eligible for ranking. With all of that being said, I do think we have our first A-tier villain on the list with Waternoose. Randall, on the other hand, lands somewhere in the high C tier, but if he became more headstrong and hands-on, he could easily be ranked higher. Ah, <sighs> Finding Nemo. Well, obviously the villain here has to be that freaking Barracuda that ate all of Nemo's siblings, his mother, and literally left him disabled. Let me do a quick Google search just to double check. Okay, who is the villain in Finding Nemo? Uh, okay, so upon further research, the villain in Finding Nemo is not the fish that wiped out the entirety of Nemo's bloodline, but is actually Darla. Yes, that Darla. The very loud, very annoying child that fashionably sports the latest headgear and light up sketchers. And she is the villain because she shakes fish aggressively inside plastic bags. All right, well, there you have it, folks. Darla Sherman for your crime of repeated fish murder. I hereby sentence you to 20 years in prison with no parole and a spot on the S tier of villainy. <laughs> Just kidding. Girl, you are F tier. Bye bye. Along the same vein, Finding Dory doesn't have much of a villain either, besides the group's unfortunate run in with a giant squid who chases them and attempts to eat Nemo. Please put that kid down. He has been through enough. F tier. Didn't even feel like doing this one chronologically. All right, finally some real villainy has come to play. No offense to the past few films we've reviewed, but I'm ready to get to some real bad guy stuff, and there is obviously no better place to find it than in The Incredibles. I mean, it is a superhero movie after all, and what good are superheroes without an equally good, or, or bad, villain? Meet Syndrome, aka Incrediboy, aka Buddy Pine. Yeah, okay, I can see why he changed the name a few times, because Buddy doesn't necessarily scream villain. Well, to be fair, he didn't start out as a villain. In fact, through a shocking turn of events, he was actually Mr. Incredible's biggest fan and admirer. I am your ward. Incrediboy! Unfortunately, after being rejected as his sidekick during his Incrediboy days, he decided to become Syndrome and turn towards the side of evil. His new goal? Destroy Mr. Incredible, his family, and soon, every other superhero for good, so he could be the only one left. Jeez, talk about rejection sensitivity. His actions include building a giant killer robot and unleashing it on the city so he could pose as an amazing hero that saves the day to get respect and admiration, holding Mr. Incredible hostage and convincing him that he's destroyed his family, attempted murder, and kidnapping Jack-Jack. He proves he doesn't value human life multiple times, even endangering the very people he was supposed to protect in order to prove a point. When he was younger, we can see he wasn't always destined for evil, and even had the chance to have a bright future. He was incredibly smart and driven, creating multiple successful complex inventions from a very young age. 
I invented these. I can fly. However, when he decided to use his intelligence for evil, he easily became one of the baddest Pixar villains yet. Syndrome possesses an intelligence and merciless personality we have not seen from any of our antagonists yet. Not only that, but even after he explains his behavior to Mr. Incredible and he apologizes, I was wrong to treat you that way. I'm sorry. Syndrome's thirst for power and fear continue to be a driving force for him over doing any kind of good. Even down to his moral compass, Syndrome believes that mercy is a weakness, and complete control through fear is the only way he can be respected. So, through his very blatant disregard for human life, his selfishness, and his apathy towards murder and wiping out an entire city for his own pleasure, I'd say Syndrome comfortably sits up top as an S-tier villain. Thankfully, he was defeated, because if he continued at the rate he was going, it would have been very bad news for everyone. All right, everyone, rev up your engines, because it's time to speed into our next trilogy, Cars. Starting us off strong in the first film, we meet our protagonist, Lightning McQueen, a cocky race car with a bad attitude. Then we meet our villain, Chick Hicks, a cocky race car with a bad attitude. Wait. So, our protagonist and our villain are essentially the same character? Okay. Well, hopefully our protagonist goes through some sort of life-altering experience that not only changes the way he views himself, but also the importance of teamwork and selflessness, so we can at least differentiate the two when they are put back into the same environment so we can admire the character growth and progress our protagonist has gained through the experience he endured through happenstance. But surely that won't happen, right? Spoiler alert, it does. So after McQueen goes through said life-altering experience, he's thrown back into the world of racing, and now greatly contrasts Chick Hicks's character. Aside from being a grade A piece of work, Chick Hicks also uses dirty tricks to greatly incapacitate one of the other racers in the final race. Though he ends up winning the race due to his cheating, he reveals his true conniving character to the world, and loses the respect and admiration of all those who witnessed his dirty tricks. Chick as a villain has some nasty moments, but doesn't seem to pose any more of a threat outside of a speedway, so he lands himself in the C tier of villainy. Hold it up! Our next film is Ratatouille, and we've got a villain that makes Gordon Ramsay look like a walk in the park. Chef Skinner is best known for his sweet, calm, and understanding demeanor. Yeah, right. Skinner, the head chef under the recently deceased Gusteau at his restaurant, is a greedy, self-serving man. Upon hiring the young and naive Linguini, he was primarily focused on keeping the restaurant afloat. However, as he begins to notice strange events unfolding involving a rat and Linguini, he is determined to expose them. Taunting me with that rat! Rat? Yes, he's consorting with it! He goes to extreme lengths to prove that what he is seeing is true. And to be honest, I do feel slightly bad for the man, since he is constantly gaslit about a rat that is using a human vessel to create magnificent dishes. However, he truly becomes diabolical when he discovers that Linguini is Gusto's son and rightful heir to the restaurant. Instead of informing Linguini and losing his position, he hides this from him and eventually kidnaps Remy, who he intends to hold hostage and forced to create a frozen food line under Gusto's name to solely profit on. Though definitely flawed, Skinner's actions aren't too terrible, and his behavior is definitely far off from the worst thing that those working in the restaurant industry has ever experienced. His true crimes are being a big fat greedy jerk. Compared to the others listed, that doesn't really measure up, so I think he belongs on the D tier. Up next is Wally. Picture this. The year is 2100, and Earth is completely uninhabitable, or so you think. Your entire life you were told that no life can be sustained on Earth due to the pollution and neglect that was done by the hands of humans. However, there was an attempt to clean the Earth up with the hopes of bringing back humanity and starting again, but unfortunately the plan was unsuccessful. Unknown to you, there happen to be two little robots who have found a sign of life and are determined to reach the captain of the giant ship carrying all of humanity to inform him that to returning to Earth may actually be possible. It's time to go back home. Home? We're going back? Unbeknownst to everyone else, however, the second-in-command robot on the ship, Otto, was actually programmed many years ago to never let the ship return to Earth. Otto goes to great lengths to stop Wally and Eve from reaching the captain with a plan from the Earth, even going so far as to send Wally and the plant tumbling down into a trash compactor to be forgotten about forever. 
Otto also turns on the captain, the very person he should be assisting and abiding to. Sure, we could all give this robot the benefit of the doubt and say that it was just doing what it was programmed to, but thinking as someone who would have been put on that ship along with the rest of humanity, I would have found this robot to be very, very evil. When you think about Otto's actions and the fact that hiding the sign of life from Earth could have literally doomed humanity to live out the rest of their days floating aimlessly in space, severely incapacitated and vulnerable instead of living a good quality life on Earth like our ancestors before, the robot's actions are pretty insane. Plus, Otto nearly killed precious Wally. Who could do such a thing? All of these things considered, Otto's influence could have greatly jeopardized the entire human race to a terrible rest of eternity. So I'm going to go ahead and rank this bot as an S tier villain. It's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's our next film up. Now I know what you're thinking. There's no way a movie with such a wholesome premise starring an old man, a boy scout, an adorable talking canine companion, and a giant silly bird could even have a hint of evilness. But you couldn't be more wrong. Though we could talk about the true villainy that occurred when the writers decided to kill off Ellie. I will never forgive you for that, by the way. We're here to talk about this man, Charles Muntz. Muntz was an amazing explorer who was adored by millions of children all over the world, including young Carl and Ellie. However, when the group happens to run into him on their mission to return Kevin to her family, they soon learn all too well that it's never a good idea to meet your idols. Muntz presents himself as a kind and successful explorer, but as they learn more about him, he begins to seem... off. They find out that Muntz has been on the pursuit of a giant colorful bird for years, and they quickly realize that their good friend Kevin is actually in grave danger. Muntz threateningly alludes to the fact that he has dealt with many others in the past that have attempted to capture the bird before him. Here they come, these bandits, and think the bird is theirs to take. And that he will go to extreme measures to end up on top, even if that involves murder. Upon realizing that Carl and the others know where the bird is, Muntz begins to become hostile and immediately becomes their enemy. In an attempt to separate the group, he attempts to set Carl's house on fire, nearly taking away the only thing he has left to remember his late wife. After Carl decides to try and save Kevin from the Explorer, Munt continues to attack them, even firing a rifle towards them and attempting to pop the balloons on Carl's house in an attempt to kill them all. Though he wasn't an evil genius, Charles Muntz is still one of the most outwardly evil villains that Pixar has offered us. We don't know the exact number of hopeful explorers that he's killed, but the ease he had with deciding to kill an innocent elderly man, child, and dog, it's safe to assume that this definitely wasn't his first, second, or third rodeo. His willingness to continue this behavior even after years and years of searching proves that he would have done just about anything to capture the bird and redeem his name in the scientific community no matter how long it took. Because of this, I believe he's on the A tier of Pixar villains. Continuing on this harrowing toy journey, we have Toy Story 3. After being packed away to go into the attic by college-aged Andy, Andy's mother accidentally places the trash bag with all of the toys with the other bags of trash. After barely avoiding being tossed into the garbage truck, the toys decide to get into the donation box that Andy's mother brings to a local daycare. Okay, pause. So this is the second time that Andy's mom's incompetence has put these toys through traumatic events. Are we sure she isn't the real villain? Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. I got a little heated there, but seriously, woman, you need to pay better attention. All right, back to business. Upon arriving at the daycare, the toys meet a stuffed purple bear named Lotso, who seems to be the head of this very well-oiled machine that he has created. Lotso runs a tight ship, and is surrounded by countless lackeys who cater to his every whim and make sure all of the toys play the part that is expected of them. Initially, he doesn't seem like such a bad bear, but once Andy's toys start showing the slightest signs of rebellion, we see Lotso's torturous tactics come to life. From reprogramming Buzz, forcefully breaking toys that attempt to escape, and controlling those around him through fear and manipulation, Lotso definitely secures his spot as one of the more sinister villains of the series. Even after Andy's toys manage to escape, Lotso continues to follow them, determined to make everyone else as miserable as he is. Since he was abandoned and replaced by the child that owned him, he strongly believes that every toy is meaningless and replaceable, and he never lets those around him forget it. Even after they all end up getting tossed into a garbage truck and taken to the landfill, 
Woody and the gang still turn the other cheek to Lotso and team up with him to stop them all from falling into the trash incinerator. However, once he gets the chance, Lotso turns on them and leaves them to burn alone. Thankfully, that doesn't happen, and the toys live to see another day and eventually return to Andy, who decides to give them to Bonnie since he's going off to college. Lotso is found by a garbage truck driver and is tied to the front of his truck, solidifying a not-so-happy fate for the sadistic bear. After the loss of their dictator, Sunnyside Daycare becomes a whole lot happier, and we see the toys genuinely thriving without the tyranny of Lotso. Unlike our friend Stinky Pete, Lotso doesn't really show that he has the possibility of redemption, and that becomes especially solidified when he chooses to leave the rest of the toys to die. So far, he seems like the worst villain the toys have faced, and I believe he earns a spot on the B tier. I mean, the guy turned a daycare into a Shawshank prison for toys. Racing over to Cars 2, we have Sir Miles Axelrod. Just another cocky race car who wants to beat Lightning McQueen in a race. Wait, hold on a second. Okay, uh, no, so after checking my notes, I appear to have made a mistake. Sir Axelrod is actually a terrorist. My apologies. Wow, that is a very intense jump up from the first movie. Oh my god, are we sure this movie is still about cars? Okay, so Sir Axelrod, the terrorist, begins his evil scheme by hosting the World Grand Prix. It is my absolute honor to introduce to you Grand Prix. Where he draws in the best and brightest from the racing industry from all over the world to participate and test his new environmentally friendly fuel. However, once the races begin, some cars begin to crash due to mysterious circumstances. Through a run-in with a spy, Mater finds himself thrust into solving this mystery and is able to reveal that Sir Axelrod is responsible for the crashes. Using his new fuel, Axelrod intentionally causes car engines to fail in an attempt to discredit alternative fuel and push consumers to return to buying oil instead. After controversy arrives over his alternative fuel, Axelrod lifts the requirement of its use for the final race in the Grand Prix, but Lightning McQueen still decides to continue using it. They're letting you choose your fuel for the final race. Do you have any idea what it's going to be? All in all. Which causes orders for his death during the race. Lightning McQueen must be killed. While being held hostage, Axel's underlings tell Mater that they planted a bomb in McQueen's pits. We snuck a bomb in McQueen's pit. He's going to go kaboom. And Mater breaks free and attempts to warn him. However, he soon realizes that they had actually planted the bomb on Mater and intended to detonate it to kill him and McQueen. Thankfully, the two end up exposing Axelrod's grand plan to turn the world against alternative fuel, and they successfully prevent any more damage from happening. Okay, well, that was definitely a big shift from the first movie. Axelrod caused numerous injuries, attempted murder, strapped a bomb onto an unknowing civilian, and created a giant scheme to turn buyers away from participating in environmentally friendly fuel in favor of big oil greed and a capitalistic agenda. With that long list, I can confidently say that he has earned a spot as an A-tier villain and is definitely one of Pixar's most sinister and complex. Next up, we have Brave. Oh, uh, sorry, I mean, <clears throat> Next up, we have Brave. The enemy of basically every character in the main family is Mordu, a demon bear who was once a prince. His crime, uh, being a bear and doing what bears do, killing people. At the end of the day, the worst thing he does is attack Merida's father and cause him to lose a leg. So, nothing too crazy. He's definitely just a D-tier villain, but if we were ranking Pixar bears, you already know he'd be at the top of the list. Uh, okay, okay. Thanks for bearing with me. All right, all right. I'm done with the puns. Let's just move on before it becomes unbearable. Okay, I'm serious. Let's keep it moving. Continuing with the Monsters, Inc. franchise, we have the prequel, Monsters University. So, everything we just talked about... Completely forget it, baby, because it hasn't even happened yet. So now our ferocious monster friends are in, as the title suggests, university. And do you know who the biggest villains are on a college campus? You guessed it, Greek life. <laughs> Just kidding. Or am I? Anyway, leading the campus's most popular fraternity, Roar, Roar Omega, Omega Roar, Roar, Johnny's most notable characteristic is his overconfident personality. He finds joy in tormenting the nerdy frat Uzma Kappa, which Mike is in. However, the droop draws attention while they participate in the school scare games, 
surprising everyone when they don't immediately lose. Johnny invites the OKs to a party, where he intentionally gets them on stage, where he proceeds to douse them in paint, glitter, flowers, and plushies. While this happens, a photograph is taken and put in the school newspaper the following day in an attempt to embarrass and mock the OKs. Throughout the rest of the games, Johnny continues to have a demeaning attitude towards Mike and Sully. Don't take the loss too hard. You never belonged here anyway and is responsible for exposing their cheating at the very end of the games. Though he is a pretentious jerk, Johnny didn't do anything drastically evil, and therefore doesn't rank higher than a D on the villain tiers for me. Let's move on, uh, before I get hazed. Continuing on, we have Inside Out, which I personally believe marks the beginning of the more modern Pixar that we're experiencing today. Unlike other films in the past, this movie was primarily about the internalized emotions of our main protagonist, Riley, a preteen girl. As she begins to navigate being a teenager, we get a look inside the tumultuous mind of someone going through probably the most evil thing ever experienced, puberty. Now, there has been a lot of discourse surrounding this film and who the true antagonist really is. Obviously on the surface, most people agree that Sadness was the villain. After all, it was her actions that initially set off the course of events that eventually led to Riley acting out and eventually attempting to run away from home. However, many other people believe that in this film, Joy is the villain. Throughout the events that take place, Joy's extremely toxic positivity caused even more issues than sadness. Her refusal to allow sadness's natural place in Riley's life- Well, try to think of something funny. Remember the funny movie where the dog dies? Causes so much internal distress to Riley to the point that it becomes almost insalvageable. Which makes me think, who was really to blame for everything that happened to Riley? Honestly, I don't truly think that joy or sadness were villains, and in fact, I think that labeling them as such imposes the entire message of the movie. Every person needs to feel emotions, good and bad, because without one or the other, there would be no way to know exactly how or what you're feeling. Now, setting that logic aside, I'll go ahead and rank both joy and sadness as villains for the sake of the video. Thinking back to all that we've discussed, I definitely believe that sadness would rank lower as a villain than joy, simply because her actions were more justified by the fact that she was just abiding by her nature, which is being sad and miserable. She did begin the events that ended up becoming a massive issue, so for that, I rank her as a D-tier villain. As for Joy, her actions continued to worsen an already bad situation, but she was attempting to fix things in the only way she knew how, which was toxic positivity. Was she doing more harm than good? Absolutely, but was that her intention? Truly, I don't believe it was. For that, I will also rank her as a D-tier villain. Even though I think she's more of a villain than Sadness, I don't think she belongs in the C-tier with the other villains who definitely acted the way they did with purely malicious intentions. Moving on, let's look at the good dinosaur. Our villain, Thunderclap, the leader of a gang of carnivorous pterodactyls that attempt to eat Arlo and Spot. Honestly, other than that, this guy is kind of forgettable. He's definitely an F-tier villain. All he does is try to feed himself, and he is just kind of a jerk about it. Nothing too memorable. Concluding the epic trilogy is Cars 3, where our final boss villain, Jackson Storm, trying to one-up even the horrendous crimes of Miles Axelrod, blows up an entire hospital full of... Wait. Dang it! I got my notes mixed up again. Oh, how embarrassing. Never mind, guys. Jackson Storm is just another arrogant race car with an attitude problem that races Lightning McQueen and yada yada yada. Been there, seen that, not a terrorist, so I'm bored. D tier, forgettable, and nothing we haven't seen before. Next! Now let's dive into Coco. After being abandoned by a man for his music career, Imelda, our protagonist's great grandmother, bans music within her family. Now, many years later, we meet Miguel, a young boy with a secret passion for music and a large admiration for deceased musician Ernesto de la Cruz. After knocking over a photo from his family's ofrenda, he finds that in addition to his great-grandmother and grandmother, the mysterious man that abandoned them was also in the picture. However, he is unable to identify him since someone had removed his head from the picture. But Miguel notices Ernesto de la Cruz's guitar in the man's arms and determined that he must be his missing great-grandfather. Upon learning this new information, Miguel becomes confident in revealing his love for music to his family. However, this obviously does not go over well, and his family destroys his guitar. 
In an effort to participate in a talent show, Miguel breaks into Ernesto's mausoleum and steals his guitar, which actually ends up cursing him. Okay, that was a lot of backstory, but I promise it's important to understand the severity of what's to come. So when he finally meets Ernesto in the Land of the Dead, he finds out that he actually stole all of his music and the guitar from his best friend, Hector. Please. Those were my songs you took. My songs that made you famous. What? Who Miguel also meets and teams up with in the afterlife. Their falling out occurred because Hector wanted to stop performing and return home and we can assume his intention was to settle down and raise Miguel's grandmother. Instead of handling the news like a normal person, Ernesto decided to steal everything from Hector and poison him. After realizing Miguel has figured out what he has done, Ernesto attempts to get rid of him and Hector to prevent them from returning home and tarnishing his name and legacy. So not only did Ernesto prevent a family from being together, causing multi-generational trauma, but he also murdered and stole from his best friend without remorse. Even in death, his greed and selfishness completely takes priority over doing what is right. Even after learning about all the pain his past actions have caused Miguel and Hector's family, Ernesto doesn't care and doesn't even offer a measly apology to his ex-best friend who he literally killed. The fact he remains unbothered after all of this definitely earns him a spot as an A-tier villain in my book. In Incredibles 2, we have a similar case of ordinary person turned evildoer because of past superhero letdown. Okay, that's too long. Uh, let's just call it Syndrome Syndrome. Basically, Evelyn Dever is the sister of the former CEO of a company called DevTech, and is also one of Elastigirl's past friends. However, unknown to the Incredibles, Evelyn has other intentions besides reconnecting with an old friend. She's out for revenge because she, like Syndrome, has been let down by superheroes in the past. So of course, the next logical step is to completely eradicate them. Although unlike Syndrome, who wanted to completely kill off all heroes, she just wants to make them illegal again so people would stop relying on them. Using her easy access to advanced technology, Evelyn, better known by her villain name, Screen Slaver, uses goggles to enslave and mind control those who are wearing it. She successfully enslaves Elastigirl, Mr. Incredible, and numerous other big shot superheroes. Her introverted personality that contrasts with her true nature makes her even more dangerous and conniving. As a villain, she's definitely not the strongest, but also not the weakest. She has the intelligence to become a real threat, but her attempt was very lackluster in comparison to someone like Syndrome, who is willing to do whatever it takes to completely eradicate heroes. With that being said, I think she belongs in the C tier. Now for the epic conclusion of the Toy Story franchise so far, we have Toy Story 4. When Woody and Sporky find themselves in an antique shop, they meet Gabby Gabby, a vintage pull string doll. Her wickedness stems from her voice box becoming broken, resulting in her being deemed as a useless toy and never being picked to have an owner. I'm Gabby Gabby. And, and I love you. Initially, she attempts to steal Woody's voice box for herself so she can be fixed, but after he escapes, she holds Forky hostage. She defeats Woody's numerous attempts at rescuing Forky, and they end up striking a deal to exchange Forky for Woody's voice box. After the surgery is complete, Gabby Gabby releases Forky and attempts to get the attention of the shopkeeper's granddaughter, Harmony, who Gabby Gabby had been hoping would adopt her. However, Harmony is not interested in Gabby Gabby, and the doll becomes heartbroken. The toys decide to help her out, and in the end, she successfully finds a girl to call her own. Although her methods were a little uncouth, Gabby Gabby revealed that she was defective right out of the box, and that her only dream was to find a child to love her. Does that make her actions of attempted robbery and kidnapping okay? Well, no. But it was obvious that she wasn't driven strictly by the urge to harm others, especially because she even ends up teaming up with Woody and the others after their heart to heart. Therefore, Gabby Gabby lands herself in the D tier as a villain. All right, I must admit from this point onward, our film's villains become a little less cut and dry and a little more conceptual, but nevertheless, we shall continue with Onward. After meddling in magic much too advanced for either of them, elf brothers Ian and Barley end up triggering a curse which manifests itself as a dragon made out of Ian's school. What follows is basically just a general battle with magic spells versus a giant beast. The cursed dragon is defeated and the brothers' quest can be completed. Again, most of the recent Pixar movies are focused on a familial conflict, which takes center stage in this film. 
So the dragon villain is quite weak and forgettable. F tier. In Seoul, when Joe dies in a freak accident, he finds himself in a place called the Great Before and is determined to find his way back to Earth. However, he and another soul called 22 end up becoming intertwined and both land back on Earth. 22 ends up in his body, and Joe ends up in the body of a therapy cat. During their time on Earth, Terry, an entity that is in charge of the Count of All the Souls in the Great Before, notices that there are a couple souls missing, and he sets off for Earth to find them. Since Joe and 22 are both unwilling to go back to the Great Beyond during their time on Earth, Terry's pursuit of them labels him as an antagonist. Again, labeling him as a villain when all he was doing was trying to do his job seems harsh, and compared to the others on those lists, he doesn't even come close, so he also lands in the F tier. Next up is Luca. After trading their sea legs for some land legs, Luca and Alberto infiltrate the human world. Their task, remain dry as to not reveal their true sea monster form and potentially anger the residents of the town of Porto Rosso. While living amongst humans, they soon learn that not everyone feels kindly towards their kind, and they realize the high importance of protecting their true identity. They also learn that on land, there are humans that like to bully other humans, and that's where our main antagonist Ercole Visconti is introduced. During one of his tirades, Ercole attempts to dunk Luca into a fountain, but thankfully he is stopped before he can soak the boy and reveal his identity. Later in the film, when Luca and Alberto are participating in a competition outdoors, it begins to rain. Alberto attempts to give Luca an umbrella, but Ercole smacks it out of his hands. The rain falls on both of the children and reveals their true sea monster form. Ercole's hatred for sea monsters shines through, going as far as chasing them both with the intention of harpooning them. But again, thankfully he has stopped. Even after it is revealed that multiple citizens of Porto Rosso are also sea monsters who had been living in hiding, Ercole's bigotry still continues to the point that he becomes an outcast. So this bully, who has to be around 12 years old, is so hateful that he would go as far as killing his peers? That sounds pretty messed up to me. But besides the whole sparing his enemies parts, most of his actions up until that point were nothing more than your average bully. With all of that considered, I think Ercole earns a spot as a D-tier villain. Turning Red is another example of a Pixar film based around familial conflict that doesn't have a true villain. Though, if we were to examine the film closely, I guess we can name Ming Li, Mei's mother, as the main antagonist of the film. However, Ming is not the main villain in this story in its entirety. In fact, if we look at the grand scheme of this family and the curse they have endured for generations, we can see that Ming Li, as well as Mei, and the other women in their family are all equally victims to the curse and the generational trauma that is experienced by all of them in different ways. Since Ming Li is the antagonist of Mei's story, however, she is, in my opinion, unfairly dubbed as the villain, and with all of that in mind, falls within the F tier. Now, if we had to rank generational trauma as a villain, that'd be S tier, but that's probably too deep of a subject to get into today, so, uh... Here, look at this kitten to cheer you up. Better? Alright, let's move on then. Next up, we have Lightyear, the spin-off movie stemming from our friend Buzz Lightyear of the Toy Story franchise. This film is the movie that the Buzz Lightyear toy that we know and love so much is based off of, which means we get to meet the real Zerg, Buzz's arch nemesis. After traveling significantly farther in the future due to time dilation, Buzz returns to his colony to find that Zerg and his Zyklops robots have invaded. After capturing Buzz, Zerg reveals himself to be an older Buzz from an alternate timeline. He explains that in his timeline, he traveled to the future and was exposed to advanced technology, which he used to travel back in time. And I ended up in a future you wouldn't recognize, filled with technology you can't imagine. He continues on and reveals that he intends to go back to the past and stop Buzz from stranding his crew on the planet they discovered. However, Buzz realizes that this means the elimination of his friend's existence, and begins to battle Zerg. After an intense fight, Buzz causes an explosion and seemingly kills Zerg, but in an epilogue, it is shown that he survives. So this alternate universe Buzz turns into Zerg and is willing to go all the way back to the past, even at the cost of completely wiping his friends from existence. Okay, I've got to give him some points for that. Even though, besides that, this version of Zerg is quite lackluster, I can comfortably say he falls in the C tier. 
Finally, we have arrived at Pixar's newest release, Elemental. Following a trend here, however, there is no villain in this film, as our main characters mainly just battle societal and familial expectations within their lives and relationships. I've tried my best to at least bring someone to rank for these movies, but in this case, there isn't one character I could pin as someone who could possibly fall within the rankings. So, uh, that covers all of Pixar's feature films. But for funsies, Let's take a look at a few of their shorts and do a speedrun ranking. In Buzz Lightyear Star Command, we meet Zerg again. Though this time his character is more of a comedic relief character. Don't let this fool you, he still retains his evilness and his drive to destroy Buzz and cause havoc, but he loses his edge as a serious villain. For that reason, I can't rank him above Zerg in Toy Story 2, so unfortunately, this version of Zerg is an F-tier villain. In Toy Story of Terror, Bonnie's family and the gang stay at a motel run by a man named Ron Tompkins. However, the toys are captured in the night by his pet iguana, and they find out that Ron uses his pet to steal toys and knickknacks from his guests so he can sell them online for a profit. When he's caught, Bonnie's mother threatens to call the police, and Ron panics. When the police arrive, he sneaks out the back door and attempts to escape by stealing the police's car, which obviously doesn't go well. This dude is just a self-made businessman who has a side hustle, and I can respect that. As far as villains go, however, I'd say he's an F tier as well. In the Toy Story that Time Forgot, Bonnie brings her toys over to her friend's house where they encounter the Battlesaurs and their leader, the Cleric. Bonnie and Rex attempt to bond with their dinosaur brethren, but because the toys had not been played with yet since they were gifted to Bonnie's friend for Christmas, they are unaware that they are toys and begin to attack all the surrounding toys. While fighting, the toys realize that the cleric is actually aware that he is a toy, but he continues to attack them anyway, attempting to throw Buzz, Woody, and Angel Kitty into an air vent to their demise. Thankfully, the situation is de-escalated when Bonnie and her friend begin playing with the toys. The cleric holds control over all of the toys in the playroom and continues to be aggressive towards them while pretending not to know better. That's just sick, man. Come on. Though he wasn't a destroyer of worlds, he still seemed to get some pleasure from creating chaos and violence, so I'll place him in the D tier. Finally, we have that godforsaken lamp. You know, the one from the Pixar intro that mercilessly stomps on the poor letter I over and over and over again before each and every movie? That lamp never gets tired of mercilessly bludgeoning that poor and defenseless bow, and does so with such a sick and twisted look of pure bliss on its disgusting, bulb-like face. This horrible monster has exposed millions of children over the past decade to senseless violence and corruption, and I will not stand for it any longer. It makes me sick, and it truly deserves a tear of its own, because wherever it ends up in the afterlife, I know it will be hot. Well, now it looks like our list is complete. Now, what did we learn today, kids? That if you're going to be a villain, you better give it your all and look cool while doing it, or else you will be made fun of on the internet for years to come. Or in the immortal words of super villain Megamind, PRESENTATION! I hope you enjoyed the video and agree with the rankings. Have a different opinion? Comment down below your thoughts and how you would have ranked them. Go out into the world, be safe, and please try not to unleash giant destructive robots on your city. See you next time!